like to start this um, time together with a quiz. So let's see um, how much you understand about different cultures, okay? Because you've been hearing about this, and I heard that Melbourne is the best place to live in the world. People are moving in by thousands and uh, from, from all over. And I can see here with this audience, uh, I'm learning every time I talk to someone coming from a different country. So this is amazing. So my question for you is, how, um, how much should we know about another culture? How to connect with people? And to create a first good impression, and you know you don't have a second chance for that, uh, with people of different cultures, okay? Are you ready for that? What do you think? Is that a good idea? Okay, so let's go then. Is it common to use uh, knife and fork? No, I did not ask yet where, so hold on. <laughs> These people, they, they are too fast. I mean, in Bolivia, to eat banana. In, hold on, let me finish. <laughs> Slow down. In Brazil, to eat pizza. In the United States, to eat pizza. Think about it. Okay, let's try again. In Bolivia to eat banana, yes or no? Well, are you from Bolivia? So how do you know then? Yes, <laughs> yes, you're right, yes. We use fork and knife to eat banana in Bolivia. I, don't ask me why, okay? It doesn't make sense, but this is the way they do it. In Brazil to eat pizza. Yes, we use fork and knife to eat pizza. In the States, Anthony, no, yeah, they, I don't understand why, but this is the way they eat pizza, using their hands, that's it, okay? All right, are you ready for the second one? Where is my friend from Korea? Oh, there she is, in Korea, and you help me out if this is right. It, it is considered being polite. Hold on, don't answer yet, I did not ask why, you know, in what moment, okay? Okay, to finish, no, I, I show you. <laughs> now I was too fast. In Korea, is it considered being polite? To finish all the food. Oh, you saw that. <laughs> no, it's not polite. And you correct if I'm wrong, so, but not now, after. Okay, don't correct me in front of them. When we finish, you come to me. <laughs> to refuse more food unless it is offered three times. For the guest to pay for the meal. Think about it. Okay? To finish all the food, yes or no? You know that. No. Okay. To refuse more food. Is it polite or not? Yes. Unless it is offered three times. Then after the third time, then you say, oh, yes, if you want more. See, in America, they, ask, they offer you once. If you say no, forget it. They are gone. <laughs> Is that way, my friend? <laughs> That's the way. <laughs> okay, yeah. For the guest to pay for the meal. Is it polite? Not at all. No, no, no. You invite someone, you pay for it. But we are not in Korea, right? We are in Australia, so. In China, it is considered bad luck. Someone from China, here? China background? No, really? Okay, so you don't know, you don't have to debate this. But is it considered bad luck to, to drop the chopsticks? Yes, it is. Bad luck. I don't know why, but it is. Who should pay for the meal in France? Ah, if you ever go to France, any French here? I don't think so. No? But in France, if you are in Europe, especially in France, uh, who should pay for the meal? The guest, the owner of the restaurant, or the host? Oh, we are receiving conflicting messages here. The guest, no, the guest don't pay for. The owner of the restaurant, of course not. He will, he will go bankrupt if he close the deal. I mean, not the owner, of course not. The host. Yes, yes, the host. Okay, so let's, let's uh, change the, the country in the States. 
who should pay for the meal in the States? Any American um, beyond um, uh, Anthony here? <laughs> or the government? <laughs> the government is not in the list. So let's go again. Uh, who should pay for the meal in the, in the US? Oops, I lost connection. No. The guest, the owner of the restaurant, or the host? Who should pay for? The guest? Mm, no. No, not the guest. The owner? Of course not. No, no, no. Uh, the host? No. So who you pay then? Who you pay? <laughs> Everyone will pay. <laughs> We share the bill. This is the way we do in America. I know you may not like it, but um, this is the way it is. In America, we share. So everyone pays for the bill. Okay? We share the costs. <laughs> now let's go to India now. And uh, Ronald's going to help us out. Any other Indian here? No? Ronald, you're the only one. So don't correct me in front of them again. But. <laughs> If you see an Indian, in, Indian, it means someone from India, eating a hamburger, beef hamburger, on McDonald's, it means that, wait and see the options. I don't know, it's so slow here. Okay. <laughs> He's a Muslim. Think about it, don't answer. He's a Christian. He doesn't follow the Seventh-day Adventist health reform. <laughs> He's a Muslim? Yes, maybe. It could be, right? Am I right? It could be a Muslim because, you know, it's beef hamburger. It's not pork. If it was pork, he wouldn't be eating. But it could be a Muslim. He's a Christian. Yes? Okay. Yes, maybe. It could be a Christian or maybe not. He doesn't follow the Seventh-day Adventist health reform. Oh, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes, he doesn't follow the health reform. That's for sure. Okay, what's the point then? Indian Hindus, Buddhists and Sikhs revere cows as sacred and do not consume beef. So an Indian eating a hamburg in the McDonald's, he is not a Hindu by religion or Buddhist. Okay? But he might be Christian or Muslim. Does it make any sense? Ronan, so far? Is it okay? No. <laughs> Be mindful how you eat and drink with people of those uh, different countries. Okay? In Spanish, it is a compliment to say, La comida está exquisita. Is that right? Yes or no? Está bien? Sí, está bien. This, is a, this food is exquisite. Okay? It's a compliment. Right? So it's fine. In Portuguese, if you go to Brazil and say, La comida está exquisita. Is that good or bad? It's terrible. It's an insult. Because it means that the food is weird. Something is wrong with this food. Okay? Same word, but totally different meaning in another country, in another language. So it's an insult to say, a comida está esquisita. For a Brazilian or Portuguese. Okay, let's, um, let's um, think about different countries. Be mindful of how you eat and drink with people of these places. In Thailand, we have, no, we have someone from Malaysia, but not Thailand. Do we have anybody from Thailand here? No, no Thailand. Don't put food in your mouth with a fork. You don't do that. You just don't do it. In Japan, never stick the chopsticks upright in your rice. Don't do that. This brings uh, bad luck or means that uh, how someone died in the house. It's, it's terrible, so don't do it. Just don't do it. I really don't know exactly the meaning, but just don't do it. In the Middle East, 
India and parts of Africa, don't eat with your left hand. It is disrespectful. It, uh, the left hand is used for personal hygiene. So you just don't, don't handle anything with the left hand. Don't eat with your hand. I don't know what uh, you know, some people will do, but um, that's the way it is. In Mexico, never any Mexicans here. No, no Mexicans. No, we have South Americans but no, and Central Americans, but not Mexicans. But in Mexico, never eat tacos. Well, never eat tacos with fork and knife, okay? <laughs> you use your hand. That's the way you eat tacos in uh, Mexico. All right, just be mindful. People are so different depending on the country they come from. That's the, the bottom line, okay? Did you learn something new today? So if you ever go to my place and visit us at home, don't tell us the comida está esquisita, okay? <laughs> don't tell me that. That's really bad. That's not a compliment. Okay, I want to share with you some, um, some thoughts about um, a very interesting story in the Bible that is in uh, Luke chapter 24. And uh, the title I put for this message is The Way of Trials and Hope. This is probably one of the uh, last um, uh, encounters of Jesus with uh, uh, some of the disciples. We really don't know many de details of those two disciples, but we will never heard about them if it was not for that journey from Jerusalem to Emmaus. But before we read in the Bible their stories, I want to highlight a, a couple of uh, thoughts about mission, introducing our, our topic. Um, in this picture on, on the top, you see Ellen White in the center and her two sons on the side. Willie is on the uh, left side and Edison, the last one on the right. By his side, and you see the picture below, is Edison and his wife Emma. What is interesting about um, Edison? I'm just going to focus on, on Edison. They had four children, but uh, Willie and Edison were the only ones that uh, reached um, uh, mature age. Uh, Edison was away, uh, kind of detached from their home and, and fam close uh, family, and even from the fellowship of the church for almost four decades. And he received several messages from um, his mother. One of the letters, there is a quote that I want to highlight as part of the introduction of this message. When uh, Ellen White wrote saying, we are forming characters for heaven. No character can be complete without trial and suffering. Keep this thought in your mind. No character can be complete without trial and suffering. Nothing is easy on this world. Everything demands a lot of dedication, hard work, and commitment. In the spiritual life, it's the same. It's the common principle. And God gives us, through the, you know, the ways of uh, trials and challenges in our life, He gives us opportunity for growth. No character can be complete without trial and suffering. Uh, there is another interesting uh, story that comes right after this in the life of Edison. As I said, he was away for a long time. And he finally accepted that uh, invitation to recommit himself to the Lord. And he partnered with someone else and they start this ministry by the Mississippi River. This is the boat called Morning Star. Around 1894, this picture was taken and they were docked along the Mississippi River. And this boat was actually a school, uh, evangelism center, a church. They did everything from that boat. From that boat, they reached out to communities that haven't been reached before. And White said, many times those communities were neglected. The African descendants living in the South, nobody was reaching them. So Edison, after being away for so long, he felt, he was impelled to commit himself to God's work, reaching out to those communities. Uh, a couple of um, years later, uh, two other people bought a property in Alabama, 
uh, which become, uh, became well known as the Oakwood Industrial School. That was in 1896. And among the first graduates, about 16 young people graduating there, was a young lady. And she became later on Mrs. Bradford. And she was uh, uh, the uh, grandmother of um, elders, Elder Charles Bradford that became the first African-American president of the North America division in our church. So in a small beginning, we never know the reaction, the results that will take place decades, generations later. Edison accept the call, and he went. Uh, what is the name of the first missionary? You always think about um, Andrews being the first uh, missionary, but actually Michael, uh, uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to need the help of my, my friend, Merik. What, how do you say his name? Exactly, that's the way you say it. You heard that, right? Uh, he was the first missionary, the first missionary of the church. He was never officially sent by the church. There were some um, concerns about his background. He was a Polish uh, former Catholic priest, and he requested to be sent uh, to his native continent uh, and country, Poland, and requested to be sent there uh, to be a missionary and start preaching the second coming in Europe. But the, the Adventist leaders, they decide they didn't trust him because of his personality, his style. So he never officially sent him. But he found a way to be sponsored by, an, by another, son, another church denomination, a Sunday keeping church, and he was sent to Europe. But arriving there, he started preaching about the Sabbath, the second coming, and he preached the Adventist doctrine. Well, the sponsors didn't know that till, you know, years later. And the new converts didn't know that they were actually Seventh-day Adventists. But they didn't know about the church in North America. And the leaders of the church in America didn't know about the new converts in Europe. It took a few years for them to realize. And some of those Adventist people in Europe came for the general conference meeting. Actually, the first one who came came late and did attend the meeting. But he spent several months, almost one year, learning more about the process and how the Adventist church operates. Well, bottom line is this. The, you know, the concern that some of the Adventist leaders had was confirmed by uh, Michael's style of approaching and leading uh, uh, people. And how did they found out those people, they were Adventists, or they heard about the Seventh-day Adventist church in the first place? They found among, among his papers documents about the Seventh-day Adventist church that they never heard before. So it was very, you know, unique the way all those things happened. But the bottom line is this. Ten years before the church sent the first official missionary to Europe, God sent someone else with a um, you know, reputation that could be debated. Uh, you know, the brethren didn't um, um, had real confidence in him, but God used him anyway. So God can use anybody. He even used a donkey. And you know that story in the Old Testament. He can use anyone that can put, want to put his life or her life in God's hands. And he can lead out and do things that we never believe would be possible. So uh, during that time, the church was a small church. No more than 3,500 member church. Predominant in New England, Michigan, New England, uh, the northeast uh, of the United States. And uh, reaching now immigrants and populations of other countries, that was, um, you know, it took this denomination 30 years to officially send the first missionary. Can you imagine that? Yeah, because we, the movement is kind of started in 1844, and uh, Andrews was sent in 1874. So it took 30 years for us as a denomination to send our first, first missionary. And it's in the, uh, interesting to see that Don, John Andrews uh, was a former president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And he became the first official uh, missionary to be um, sent to overseas. It was on our church's finest hour, some of the historians uh, says. Meanwhile, in Europe, Michael, um, uh, check 
Havisk, uh, whatever pronunciation it is, uh, followers were, were accidentally discovered about the Adventist organization, and then they start communicating with the folks in North America. So Adventists in the United States still arguing about the feasibility of taking their teachings beyond national borders. And God already sent, you know, people preaching the gospel in other countries. Similar thing happened in South America and in other places of the world. Not, sometimes not the most qualified people it start to work. But God can use anyone. For nearly 30 years, uh, it happens in South America and other parts of, um, you know, at the end of the century, uh, of the 1900s, uh, 1800s, the 19th century, uh, it happens also in, in, in Africa and other parts of the world. During that time, Ellen White uh, later described this uh, situation while he, uh, she was living here in Australia in the 1890s. She wrote about those, um, uh, the need to send uh, missionaries overseas. And in 1901, she declared uh, during a general conference session that the vineyards includes the whole world and every part of it is to be worked right after when she came back from Australia. And then this emphasis of sending missionaries and uh, strong work to reach the large cities of the world. Uh, not too long later, she was living in California and uh, uh, Pastor Daniels, a former missionary, now was the president of the church. And he traveled all the way from the east coast of the United States to the west coast, which is a long I mean, even today, by plane, I mean, six hours uh, flying, it's a long flight. Well, imagine going by train. It took him a long time to get there. And then when he arrived, he came to talk to the lady, and she didn't come down the stairs to talk to the general conference president. And she sent a message. Until you do what's supposed to be done to reach the large cities in the world, we're not going to talk. Well, he took it serious, uh, that she definitely made an impact. Uh, later on, uh, in, the, in the early, uh, like 10 or 15 years later, Spicer, William Spicer became uh, president of the Adventist Church, also after serving mission work in India. Did you attend uh, school in, uh, in Pune? No, no. But we have an university there, Spicer, University. It's the, the uh, major school we have in India, uh, honoring William Spicer that served as a missionary in India for so long. And he became also um, a president of the General Conference. By 1910, a steady stream of missionaries was heading out. The mission fields prior to 1880s were joining the United States as new Adventist homelands. So this is what happened. Most of the missionaries that went in the 1880s, after 20, 30 years, now they were returning home. And they became, some of them became key leaders in our church's organization. So the emphasis on mission came back again, having missionaries, former missionaries, in charge of key positions of the church. A new publication came out in 1912, uh, Mission Quarterly was established in that time telling the stories of missionary families, including the Stows in North America, Gustav Perk in Russia, the Robinsons in South Africa, and others who had left the United States knowing they might never come back. And some of them really never came. In 1921, Spicer, uh, this one we have in the picture, he wrote, our story of missions for col colleges and academies. And he said, its uh, mission is not something in addition to the regular work of the church. Let me say it again. This quote is from Spicer in 1921. He said, mission is not something in addition to the regular work of the church. The work of God is one work, the wide world over. To carry the one message of salvation to all peoples, is the aim of every conference, every church, every believer. So mission is not another work to be done. 
It is their work to be done. That's the reason we exist. Well, uh, let's, um, uh, let's consider this. I read a few, um, few weeks ago, I was reading a, a site about uh, um, some experiments in the University of um, Virginia. And the, his professor, this professor, Dr. Cohen, uh, he made an experiment uh, using 22 young uh, adults, uh, students from the university, and he um, submitted those participants under uh, MRI scans of how the brain reacts in face of a difficult situation or stress, under stress. And he found out that when uh, those who are under stress have someone, a friend, uh, holding their hands, the brain reacts in a different way. If someone that is not close to them were holding their hands, there was no difference if they were by themselves or someone that they didn't know, they didn't trust. You see the difference? What is the difference of having someone by your side when you are facing challenges in life? So that's the main question that I want to go over with you. And to understand uh, the meaning of this text, we're going to read a few verses in Luke chapter 24. So let's read a, a few verses. It starts from verse 13. And you know the story very well. So I'm going to highlight um, some of the things that for me was um, you know, uh, most uh, interesting in this context of the importance of having someone by your side when you are facing challenges, when you are under a stressful situation. But why I'm talking about this with leaders and elders? As a leader in the church, as an elder in the church, do you face challenging situations? Do you have to face some challenges? Yes or no? All the time. Because you are talking about people, right? I have a nephew. He was a veterinary, and his specialty is taking care of cows. You know, he said it's much easier to take care of cows than people. <laughs> you know, people are more complicated. <laughs> they are way more complicated. But uh, so if you are a leader, you have problems in the church all the time because we have people. We deal with people. So uh, in this story, let's, let's read a few verses. Now that the same day, starting on verse 13, Luke 24, verse 13, it says, now that same day, what day was that? What day was that? We are talking about a special day. What day was that? Was the first day of the week, the day? You know, the, the day that Jesus resurrected, exactly, the first day of the week. And it just... You can read about this in the previous verses. So in that same day, even though most of the disciples didn't believe that Jesus was resurrected, he was alive. By the way, if they knew that he would have fallen a different track. Because remember, so many times he said, I will raise from the dead and I will meet you in Galilee. And the story says that they were stuck in Jerusalem. They didn't go to Galilee. They remained there. And with the doors closed because they were afraid. They didn't know Jesus had resurrected. Now that they receive uh, some stories about a woman that came back from the tomb, Peter and John was telling that one of them saw Jesus, and they, all those stories, they, it didn't make any sense for them, even though Jesus repeated so many times that after the third day, he would resurrect. And this happens to us also. There are so many things in the Bible that is so clear. But when we face a, situ a challenging situation, it looks like we forget everything and get into despair. And I don't know what to do. And we feel lost. Let's go to the text again. Now that the same day, two of them, two of the disciples, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, a little over 10 kilometers from Jerusalem but not heading north as they supposed to, going to Galilee. They were going another direction. They were not following Jesus' word. They were talking to each other about everything that happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, and they were kept from recognizing him. I read a lot of stories in the Bible that doesn't make any sense. So now you see Jesus walking with these two. I mean, you have two young men walking on the road, and then a third person come and join them. And they don't recognize someone that have been with them for three and a half years. It doesn't make sense, right? 
Well, I can imagine like some of young people in the, in the States, they use those um, you know, hoods and they walk like this on the street, right? Uh, you can't see, you barely see their nose, you know, you can't see their face. Also, they, can't, they didn't believe that Jesus was alive, so they will never guess that Jesus was there. What else? That, that's a very good point. It probably was God's intention that he cover up Jesus' face, for they didn't recognize them <laughs> from the first place. The gardener, exactly, the same thing. They didn't yeah, serve for God's purpose. They didn't believe. They couldn't imagine that was Jesus because they didn't believe that he was alive. And somehow... God kept, you know, his face covered so they didn't recognize. And then come the dialogue. And that's the, what amazes me. They didn't recognize him and he asked them. So just stop for a moment and think about Jesus asking them. But they didn't know it was Jesus, right? And he asked five questions. We're not going to go to the five questions, okay? We didn't have time for that. We're going to uh, just... Consider three of them, because especially the last one Jesus asked, do you have anything to eat? And after noon, when you start talking about food, people get distracted. So before we go into that direction, I'm going to stop in the number three. So we're just going to focus on one, two, three. First question of Jesus, okay? Let's, let's see. What is the first question of Jesus? What are you discussing or talking about as you walk along? This is the first question. First question, what are you discussing together as you walk along? See, this question gives us some, uh, uh, a very important lesson on the way that Jesus um, treated the disciples. He, he came with a purpose. He started walking by their, themselves with a purpose, and he asked a question. That's amazing how Jesus asks questions. You know, he asks questions all the time. And I love the way that God asks questions because he asks questions that he knows the answer. It's like a young boy that went to school for the first day and as the, um, his mom went to pick him up, asked, how was school? Oh, awesome. Did you like the school? Oh, great. Did you like your f new friends? Yes. Did you like the teacher? Oh, yes. She looks like a good teacher. But I don't understand why she keeps asking. It looks like she doesn't know much because she keeps asking questions all the time. So God asks questions that he knows the answer. So why he asks questions? Because there is a purpose behind, right? Yeah, you need to think about it. So he asked a question. What are you discussing? First question in the Bible. Uh, in the Garden of Eden, God comes and, and asks, Adam, where are you? Do you think the garden was that big that man could hide from God? Of course not. He comes on another day and talks to Moses. And Moses said, no, 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 I'm not going. I'm not going. I'm not. Moses, what do you have in your hand? He knew what Moses had, but he asked anyway. Elijah, a powerful man of God. I mean, after that demonstration of power, fire came from heaven. 400 and something uh, prophets of Baal were killed. And then he ran away because of a woman. Oh, but she was a terrible woman anyway. But she ran away. And then God came to him. And he, he hid inside a cave. And God asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? He knew. But he asked anyway. He knows the answer. But he asks. The disciples were talking on the road and talking about who's going to be the most important one in, in, uh, in God's kingdom. And Jesus looked back and said, hey, you... What are you talking about? He knew. Yes. He comes to them and said, What are the son of man? Uh, what are the people talking about the son of man? Oh, some say you are uh, Elijah, the prophet. Uh, and then Jesus looked at them and said, And you, who do you say I am? See, another important question. He was not concerned about his, his reputation among the people in general. He was concerned about the disciples' understanding of his mission. So he introduced with an, another question to bring them to the most important thought. Who do you think I am? 
And Peter, with his big mouth, says, Oh, you are the Son of God. Oh, this is not from you, Peter. God revealed this to you. And in that context, Jesus said, I will build my church. But later on, he said, and you go and make disciples. So you, we change the, the, the importance of things. And we try to build up the church when Jesus said he's going to build up the church. The Bible tells us that God gives the growth, and we keep trying to make the church grow. That's not our business. Do what God asks you to do. Go and make disciples. But this first question of Jesus shows us the important lesson for me is that Jesus paid attention to them. He gave personal attention to their temporal, their daily life situation. See, God cares uh, about your daily life. That's the thing. Si a simple thing in life, your daily routine activities, God cares about you. He's interested in helping you and supporting you so you can succeed in your temporal, your material things, not just in the spiritual stuff. He sees us as a, a whole person. He wants to give us personal attention in the daily minor things of our personal life. This is what the first um, uh, question tells me about. Blaise Pascual once said, we are more, we as a rule, more easily persuaded by reasons we have discovered by ourselves than by those which have occurred in the minds of others. And this is why we use in, the, in our strategy for church planting, it is required to have a coach to support the leadership. So in spiritual leadership development, it is imperative to use the coaching approach. And the coach is not someone that will create uh, solutions for your problems. He will make questions for you're going to find out through the power of the Holy Spirit, solve your own problems. So that's the good thing. And this is what uh, Pascal is, is telling us here. So questions are unique in their power to make a difference in someone's life. Uh, Winston Churchill the, um, once said, personally, I'm more willing, I'm, I'm always willing to learn, even though uh, I don't like to be taught. So we want to learn, but we don't like people come to us and telling us what to do. Yeah, ask my wife about it. She will confirm that. Uh, so it is much better when we dialogue and ask questions instead of prescribing solutions for someone else. Do yourself before giving others you know, prescription to what to do. We use this kind of a, a three uh, steps approach for this system, and, and, and I believe Anthony is gonna talk about more about this this afternoon or tomorrow. It's a very simple thing, because I like things that are very simple, like other Christian present to us, very intentional, simple. I got a strategy from a Victorian uh, conference, because it's very simple. Uh, so this approach is very simple also. We focus on understanding self and discovering your own uh, and developing your spiritual qualities. The second thing is how you relate to others and developing your skills of relationships and how you can develop your leadership skills as you relate to others. And the third part is executive skills. I mean, strategic planning, evaluation, uh, vision, have a plan. Where do you want to go? like the questions we discussed during Sabbath school. So it's very simple, but it's extremely important. If you don't know where you're going, most probably you never get there anyway, right? So let's see another, another question. Let's, let's move on. The second question. Uh, when they answered the first question, they said, are you a foreigner? You didn't know what took place this last week in Jerusalem? And then he said, what things? He wants to go deeper in the root of the problem. He, was, he had personal interest on their feelings and the emotional area. And this is why now he asks a second question. Tell me more about it. What happened? How did you see? How are you feeling about what took place? And they start describing what happened, that Jesus was a powerful man in words and, and miracles that he performed. But then they were so disappointed because they trust that he would be the king of Israel and bring a uh, you know, solution for all the problems. By the way, he could heal the sick, resurrect the dead, 
I mean, who don't want to have a president, a prime minister like that? He will solve all the country's problems. But Jesus didn't do that. Sometimes we just focus on the things that Jesus did. Sometimes I think we do, should do the opposite. Think about what Jesus didn't do. What does it mean? Well, Jesus didn't fix the government. He didn't fix the social security. He didn't fix the health care you know, program of the country. He didn't solve the, the criminality in the society. He didn't solve all the problems. But he did some bits of things to give us hope that at the end, everything will be fixed. And if it's not, if everything is not well today, it's because it's not at the end yet. Say, if you're facing trials in your personal life, if you're facing conflicts and, and problems in your leadership, in your congregation, it's because it's not the end yet. Until we get to the end, we're going to face challenges in life. And when you think that everything is okay, everything is fine, then your dreams start falling apart. Like that weekend in Jerusalem. They have dreams for the future. They planned ahead. They put their lives uh, and their professions, everything they had before, their families, they left everything behind to follow Jesus. All the expectations they had. And then in just a few hours, everything fell apart. And they didn't understand. They couldn't realize. And the future was threatened them. What's going to happen to us? We lost everything. They were confused. But Jesus was right there. And he asked, tell me more about it. What are you really feeling? Why you are in despair? And as they start talking back to him, then he starts answering again, using the word of God, using the Bible, the prophets, the, book of, the books of Moses, the books of the law. And then he explains everything was written in the, in the, the Old Testament, the scriptures, about that those things would have to take place. There was all part of God's plan. They just need to realize and understand the big picture. They were just looking to a small piece of the whole picture. So it didn't make any sense. If you go to a beautiful um, picture like that and you look just to the corner there, what is this? It doesn't make any sense. Unless if you back up a little bit, try to look to the whole picture, and then you start, things start making sense. And Jesus explained in the whole scriptures, some key points for them to understand that his sacrifice was to bring healing, not just for the earthly problems, but to bring them hope for the eternal uh, life. They arrive in Emmaus. It was at the end of the day. A few hours walking. Probably three, two and a half, three hours. And it was getting dark. And... The one that was walking with them make like he was continued his journey. But then they said, no, it's too late. Stay with us. And actually, they were enjoying the conversation. So he stayed with them. They set up the table. And then he asked grace. And as he prayed, they recognized who that strange was. And when they realized that, he disappeared. I mean, again, things that don't make sense in the stories in the Bible, right? Now they, Jesus was right there. And I can hug him. I can ask him more details now. But then he was gone. Well, what they need to know is that he was alive. He would be with them all the time. They didn't have to worry anymore. Even if you don't understand all the details, that's the thing. God doesn't expect you. He doesn't require you to understand everything. Even... He didn't re require that you feel his presence all the time. We have to believe in his presence. It's a little bit different, right? This is what God expects from us. And in the moment that they realized it was Jesus, and they believed that he was alive, he was with them, as a person physically, he was gone. And what they did, he changed their lives again. They stood up, turned around, and went back to Jerusalem. Now it was in the middle of the night. It was a long walk 
during the day, can you imagine now it was dark night? But it doesn't matter. They have a purpose. They have a mission. So that's not a sacrifice. That's not a burden. We do because we love him. Because we know he's alive. It's not a sacrifice. It's nothing. We are not giving God anything back. When you consider the great sacrifice he did for us. By the way, he gives us purpose. So we can live better on this earth when you have a purpose in life. And we are not giving back anything. We're just enjoying serving the Lord. That is the mission work. When you realize that Jesus is alive and God is by your side. Those challenges and bumps on the road, this is nothing. This is nothing. Don't complain about that. That's nothing compared to what Jesus faced. Still talking about uh, details of emotional relationship. Two heads are better than one. Not because either is infallible. But because they are unlikely to go wrong in the same direction. So it's always good to have someone by your side. It's always good to tell others what you're thinking. Because as you speak, you process better your own thoughts. Have you think that way? I had a challenge because working you know, inside the, uh, the secretariat, so concerned about how to organize new plants and not giving up, you know, having control of the organization of, uh, over churches that are kind of innovative. I always was concerned how to do that. And I was talking to my son. He works for Adventist Health System. Uh, and I told him, I have a question for you. And uh, he doesn't understand much about church plenty, but um, he's um, an administrator, a businessman. And I, as I was asking him or telling him about my dilemma, I finished speaking and I said, oh, I know the answer. Thank you for helping me. I said, I didn't say a word. I said, exactly, that's the point. But as I uh, addressed the issue telling him about my dilemma, I figure out in my mind, and God helped me to find a solution. That's the idea, okay? Not just giving advice, but just talking to someone. You process better your own thoughts. So let's go to the third and last question, okay? Because time is uh, almost uh, done. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? That was Jesus' question uh, now. And what is the meaning of this question? See, now Jesus, he starts with a personal interest in the, you know, the daily life um, events. He moves into a deeper level, talking about their feelings, how they react, and how they were facing the challenge that they were experiencing. And he moves on to the most important level, which is this uh, deeper uh, you know, area of life about the spirituality and he wants to talk about eternal life and how the Messiah came to transform our lives so he could prepare us to be ready to live in the kingdom of God so that's the bottom line that's the most important thing all the other things are important because you cannot reach that level when you meet someone on the streets or have an acquaintance or a colleague or a co-worker and just start in trying to give a Bible study because you are so rushed to tell the truth and to share the good news, the gospel and the Sabbath and this and that and the prophecies, then we forget the other two levels. If we don't start with the superficial and then the feelings, it will be very hard to reach the heart. So that's the important lesson that Jesus has given us. And uh, trying to answer my first question as I introduced the story of um, Luke chapter 24. I told you about the importance of realizing there is someone by our side to support, to help us. I want to close with uh, telling you a story that most of you probably will remember when uh, you show this, um, you see this um, video clip. See, something happened. A uh, long time ago, uh, actually was um, when the, um, and the, we were going, to, we are closer to the another Olymp Olympic Games, but this was in 1992, during the Barcelona Olympic Games. Uh, this young man called Derek Red Redmond, he was favored to medal in the Olympic 400 meter sprint. So 
uh, during that uh, race, something unexpected happened. See, I don't know who won that race. I just remember Derek. He didn't win, but I remem remember him. If you have seen this clip before, uh, you're gonna, uh, you know, remember. But just pay attention to this story. It is an amazing story. Can you imagine more than 60,000 people watching this? You know, when he stood up again and uh, some of the uh, personnel working there said, it's over, forget about it. Just pack and go home. He said, no, I have to finish. Then his father, breaking, to, breaking through the security, came by his side and said, it's over. They already finished the race. He said, but I have to finish. I have to cross the finish line. As I told you, more than 20 years later, I don't know who won that race, who was the first one to cross the finish line, but I remember Derek, because he also finished in a different way. The last one, long time after the first one crossed the finish line, when he said, I have to do this, his father assured him, so we will do it together. That's the most important thing. You don't have to be the first one. But it's God's desire for us to finish the race. We have to finish well. And finishing well, it doesn't mean that we're going to be the first. It means that we're going to accomplish the task. You don't need to be the first, but you need to finish the race. One day when heavens was filled with his praises. One day when sin was as black as could be. One day they led him up to the Calvary's mountain. One day they nailed him to die on a tree. One day the grave could conceal him no longer. One day the stone rolled away from the door. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. And we need to finish the race. We don't have to be first. But we have to stay to the end. And he promised... You won't be by yourself. I will be with you always until the end. Even if you don't feel his presence, we have to believe 
He is by our side. Do you believe that? Is that your purpose? To be faithful to the Lord until the end and cross the finish line. We don't have to be the first, but I, wa I want to cross the finish line. Is that your desire today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. As we were reminded of your great sacrifice and your patience dealing with those uh, young men in the past, given us today in our, in our journey as we face challenges, as we face trials, the hope that soon and very soon all these uh, troubles will be over and we will see Jesus uh, the same Jesus coming back in the clouds and as our friend and as our Savior the Lord of heavens we will hear from you the words welcome son welcome my daughter welcome to the kingdom I prepare for you on that day oh Lord on that day I want to cross the finish line. I want to be ready. And I pray for all my brothers and sisters here that we all finish well, crossing the line, and live forever in your kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray.